Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our services today, commencing, obviously, with our Sunday school and Bible class, and we've been praying the Lord will bless the word to the little lambs and the young people of our congregation, and also for our family services and gospel hour. And then we do have our young adults over in Newton Arch Free Presbyterian Church after this evening's service. So quite a busy day for us all who are involved in the work of the Lord. But we're glad to see you all. We warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. And also to those that are joining with the internet, we again extend a very sincere and warm welcome to you. We trust the Lord will bless you today and your family, wherever you are, as you have joined with us for worship. We're going to commence our service by singing together the words of the hymn 439, I Have a Shepherd, One I Love So Well.
Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good singing. I did have a look round, a little look round, and uh, saw you singing very heartily as unto the Lord. We do appreciate that. We're going to still our hearts for a few moments before the Lord in prayer, asking God's blessing once again upon our coming together, our gathering throughout today. We do need the Lord, and as you appreciate, uh, without him we can do nothing. And the psalmist speaks about, my goodness extendeth not to thee. And when you think about that, you wonder what that means. And it really means that all my goodness is nothing without thee. And we have in our authorised version that little phrase, and maybe people realise and say, well, it means that God doesn't care. My goodness extendeth not to thee. Uh, the meaning of that phrase in the Psalms is very simple. It simply means that my goodness, whatever I do, is nothing without thee. It's nothing. Unless it's joined to thee, unless the Lord is in it, and our meetings are nothing, and our services are but a performance if the Lord is not with us, and the Lord is not in it. So we trust the Lord will be with us today and encourage our hearts. Just before we do pray, we'd like to say a word of thanks to all who helped with our baptismal service on Thursday evening. Some 28 people were baptized in Lisburn Free Presbyterian Church, and our sincere thanks to those who helped in so many practical ways, those who helped with the actual baptismal service in the tank, uh, for the candidates and their family and friends who came, uh, to the ladies and gents who provided and also served the supper, and to those as well who uh, laboured afterward with the clean-up and the help for the get the tank back into place again, emptied, and as well as the uh, floor put back on for the Sunday school room in Lisburn Church. Uh, we do say a sincere thanks to you, and also we have sent uh, a sincere thanks that most likely will be read out today in Lisburn Church, and also communication to the session committee, just to thank them on behalf of our congregation. And we do acknowledge the workload and the effort that our Lisburn Church made for us, very accommodating, and they have shown us great hospitality, and we do appreciate that. And we sincerely thank them, especially those present on site that gave so much help in that service. And we had a blessed night, and uh, we got through it quicker than we thought. Uh, maybe a little rushed, and we could have maybe slowed it down a little bit. as at 120 mile an hour, and uh, we got through it very, very well. Some items were left in Lisburn. Uh, some have already been collected. But if anybody this morning is barefooted, then your shoes are in my house along with your socks. Uh, so uh, there was coats, there was Bibles, there was waistcoats. A lot of coat hangers were left, and we needed them, so you'll not get them back. Uh, we'll keep them. Uh, but uh, there were other items left, Bibles and all. There was a, a Bible, by the way. Uh, if you had invited somebody, a Bible was found in the church, and it said, Matthew Gibson, and it had Cumber Gospel Hall presented by. So uh, if you know who that is, then see me, please. And if they're your shoes, then you can either text me if you're embarrassed to tell me, uh, and I'll get them to you. So please keep these things in mind. Others have collected their stuff that was left behind. And if there's anything else, then we'll have to have a search of Lisburn. No money found, not one penny found. There was five pence left on the floor of the men's changing room. Now, if you'd like to claim that, then I would like to see you do that. And I definitely mention it tonight. Okay, we'll not mention the shoes, but we certainly would mention five pence. But we had a blessed time. Uh, the Lord was with us and the fellowship afterward. And I have to say there was a, a tremendous turnout of young people. And that was remarked by our Lisburn congregation. And uh, there was a real buzz about the whole place. And it was a tremendous night enjoyed by all. And we trust the Lord will bless you and especially those candidates who have gone through the waters of baptism. We also say to you that Sophie Crawford had a little baby boy. Uh, that's the widow and wife of the late Samuel Crawford, named the child Levi Samuel. I think that's the full name. Maybe there's another name in there, but Levi Samuel anyway, uh, Crawford. So we trust the Lord will bless mother and child and the family circle at this very difficult time. Loving Father, we come into thy presence today in the Saviour's wonderful name. We come the living to praise thee. We have so much to thank thee for. We can truthfully say the Lord is good, 
a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in him. We thank thee, Lord, that our trust is in thee. Our eyes are toward thee. Lord, we know that we can turn our eyes upon the Lord Jesus. We can look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth growing strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray, O God, that oft times, yes, we're like Peter when we take our eyes off thee, but we pray, Lord, we will fix our gaze upward and heavenward, and like Stephen of old, we will see Jesus at the right hand of the Father, that we will be able to endure afflictions, Lord, we be able, Lord, to stand for thee and live for thee and to love thee, O God, with all our heart, soul and mind and strength. And we ask, O God, that we might love our fellow man as we should. And even in a wicked and evil day, Lord, save us from getting bitter. Save us from, Lord, from backsliding. Save us, O God, from ourselves today. Save us, Lord, from the old nature. And grant, Lord, that we might be strengthened with might in the inner man, that we might be empowered to live the Christian life, that we might be helped in every way and we ask, O oh God, you would draw near and minister to every single need that we have. Take of our thanks for every token of thy love. Thank thee for, Lord, so great salvation, purchased at highest cost. Thank thee for our Saviour today, a risen Saviour. We're coming up to the Easter time when we consider the trial and crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed hope that he's coming again. We serve a risen Savior and we thank thee for one who's alive forevermore and we bless thee Lord. We don't see him as the artist paints him on the cross or some picture healing. We recognize that there's no picture we could ever paint by the skill of a human hand or mind or eyes but Christ is glorified in heaven and we have the only picture of Christ given painted on the canvas of Holy Scripture by the hand of a, a, an infallible and all-wise God. And we praise thee for the description of Christ given in the book of the Revelation. And there's the picture of our Savior today. If we want to look at some picture gallery of Christ, then we would go to Revelation chapter 1. We would go to Revelation chapter 19 and we bless thee. We see him as King of kings, Lord of lords, as God of very God, as the one who is the Almighty the Savior and Redeemer, the Judge of the living and the dead, Jesus Christ is Lord. And we lift our hearts today in praise and worship and thanksgiving for how good is the God we adore. And we bless thee for one at thy right hand, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, for a broken body and shed blood, for righteousness given over to our account, for a soul that's out of hell and a body out of the grave, for a hope that's eternal and a righteousness can never be tainted and a peace that can never be disturbed. We return thanks to God. We thank thee for the temporal blessings of life. In a world, O oh God, that many don't have what we have. We have not only the necessities but luxuries of life as well. We enjoy so much from thy hand and Lord, we are eternally thankful. We're grateful today for all of thy temporal blessings and for our English Bible, civil and religious liberty. We thank thee for the gospel of thy saving and keeping power. We thank thee for thy care of thy people, thy love for thy church. We thank thee, Lord, for all that we have in our union with Christ and all that we have by way of prospect for eternity. Lord, we just return thanks today. We're a grateful people. Thank thee for blessings of the past. Thank thee, Lord, for the baptismal service on Thursday night. And for those who uh, went in obedience through the waters of baptism, we thank thee, O God, for what it signified. And we bless thee. They remembered the day of their conversion and their duty to commitment uh, to continue uh, steadfastly. And we pray you'll bless them in individually and collectively and their respective families. Remember those who gathered out of Christ without a Savior. Remember the young people that were present, those that are saved and maybe some, Lord, perhaps cold at heart or others not saved. We pray you'll meet them at the point of their need and encourage them in the things of God. Continue with us as a church family here. Lord, we do come to thee and give thanks. We thank thee for the birth too of this little boy. We thank thee, Lord, for a safe delivery for mother and child. And we pray you'll bless Sophie today. Remember little Levi, Samuel, Lord. We commend them lovingly to thee. And we remember the wider family circle, the Arnold family. We think of Kira and we think, Lord, of the Capper family and the Thompson family. We pray, Lord, for the Steele family. 
We think, Lord, of the Stalford family. We think of families in this congregation that have lost loved ones and anniversaries that are coming up. And we just commit and commend them graciously to thee. And remember others who have great need today. We think of some who are unwell. Maybe some gathered here today, Lord, and elsewhere. And they need the touch from the Lord. They need a, a healing hand upon them. We pray for them today that you will give them that touch that's so much needed. Remember our sister Yvonne Spence today, and we pray, Lord, you'll draw near. We thank thee, Lord, that she was able to make it on Thursday night for baptism. And we pray, Lord, you'll perfect that which concerns thy servant. Bless her husband, Joe, and the wider family circle. We pray for our sister, Diane Ernie. We thank thee for the measure of progress she's making, slow but sure, and still a long way to go. And we pray, Lord, you'll remember thy child and keep thy healing touch upon her. Remember her mother who's not well. Pray for Bran and Alison and Matthew and Mark and we just bring them to thee Lord and pray for them at this time remember too Philip Martin and Sandra and Sam we commend Philip to thee in ongoing need and we ask you'll draw near think of our brother Robert Shanks his sister ailing Lord and we just bring her to thee and we think of our sister Anne White and glad she's back here in the church continue thy touch upon her remember Frank Corkin today Lord we think of Mary and Neil Lord we think of our brother David McConnell and again thank thee that he's here today and we pray you'll bless these dear ones Remember John and Gemma Hamilton, Lord. We commend them lovingly to thee. We pray for Brian and Pat and for Ruth, Lord, and for our brother James King. Remember Stephen Brown today, Lord. You know all about him. We pray for James Devlin, Lord. These folks are not well. They need a touch from thee. Remember Ken Brown today, Lord. We just bring John and Martha Ferguson to thee, Lord, and John and Nell Kerr. We pray, Lord, for Billy and Muriel Potter. Lord, you know the need there. We think of our brother Bobby Moore, Lord, and Bobby Gibson. We thank thee for Bobby. And we thank thee, O oh God, for the celebration on Friday there of his 88th birthday and the years you've given to him. Thank thee for the help given even in the seniors' meeting and the fellowship dinner. And we just rejoice in thy presence and blessing. And we remember too, Lord, our sister Frances Hunsdale. We commend her lovingly to thee, Lord. We think of Rita Peacock today and Janice Cook, Lord. We just bring all these dear ones to thee. We think, Lord, of our ministerial brethren too that are not well, and Lindsay Wilson, Lord, and the Reverend Whiteside, the Reverend Harton, Lord, the uh, Reverend Beatty, Lord. You know all about them, Lord. We think of the loss of the Reverend Harry Kearns and his bereavement and the family circle and Paul and the whole family, Lord. We commend them to thee, thanking thee for the service of thy servant, the Reverend Harry Kearns, and ask that you'll draw near and comfort the family and undertake for them. We pray, Lord, for Jason, Barbara Klaus's son, who's requested prayer for his salvation. Remember, Lord, Edith Finnegan, Lord. We pray too, Lord, for Lord Raymond Stevenson. We think of Jeff Wallace. Lord, there's so many that need prayer in these days, and we just commend them lovingly to thee. Remember the Gill family circle, Lord, and the congregation in Cross Gar and the loss of a cornerstone of the work, and we just bring them to thee and pray for them. We ask too, Lord, for Owen McCartney and for his wife Gladys. We ask too, Lord, you'll draw near and comfort these individuals, so many on the list, Lord. And Lord, we never want to leave anyone out. We commend the sick and sorrowing and the bereaved to thee and those that stand in need. Remember the situation too in Ukraine. We pray for the church in Russia, the church in Ukraine. We pray, O oh God, for the church across the earth that you revive thy work and pour out of thy spirit. So be with us now, Father, in this service as we commit our way to thee, we ask for thy presence and blessing, for the comfort and grace and power of God to be upon us. Forgive us as a congregation our sins today. Lord, we confess our sin. We ask for forgiveness and cleansing through the blood. We pray, Lord, for each child of thine, for the infilling of the Spirit. We pray for those among us, young and old alike, that are out of Christ without a Savior. If they die in their sin where Jesus is, they'll never be. We pray for them that the youngest child and the oldest individual will come to realize their sinners and the need of salvation today. They repent and believe and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their own and personal Saviour. Undertake for us, O God, in our own nation and country and revive thy work. Pour out of thy spirit and Father, in answer now to prayer, glorify thy dear Son and the people of God said, Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to the Psalm 73. The Psalm 73, just as we were thinking too of the Crawford family, I do have a little card here produced by our Sandown congregation, and it's simply entitled, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and then, of course, the text of Scripture that was preached at his funeral service. 
or maybe even bef sorry, before that, the service before it, thou shalt know hereafter. There are some cards available. Sandown has sent them over to us. And if you'd like to take one of them and just have it as a reminder in honour, dedicated to the memory of Samuel Crawford. Uh, just a little card, just has some verses on it, some scripture, and just a little uh, poignant reminder of the faithfulness of this young man and to pray or for the family circle. So turn your eyes upon Jesus, and thou shalt know hereafter. The card is on the table in the hall, if you would like to take one with you, please. Psalm 73, we commence to read at the very first verse. Psalm 73, verse 1, we have the title, a psalm of Asaph, or Asaph, whatever you want to uh, say, we think it's A with a little grave accent there. A psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh throughout, through the earth. Therefore his people return hither. And waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say, I will speak thus, behold... I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. Amen. We'll end our reading there at verse 28 of the 73rd Psalm. And we know the Lord always blesses the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. We're going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, again today, it's good to see you. In the house of God, we do welcome you all, and it's encouraging to see so many out uh, with us this morning. Uh, if you're visiting, uh, then you are particularly welcome uh, amongst us, and we do pray that the Lord will bless you uh, as you sit under his word this morning. <clears throat> do you remember that uh, this is the Lord's day that we take up our missionary offering? Uh, this month, that offering will go to Let the Bible Speak. Uh, the radio and broadcast ministry uh, of our denomination uh, do uh, put the gifts for uh, let the Bible speak in the 
uh, plates that are marked for missionary offerings, if you would please. Uh, then, of course, remember that we meet again for our gospel service, 7 p.m. this evening. And, of course, prior to that, the half hour of prayer. And again, uh, the Reverend Martin will be with us, God willing, this evening. Then for the young adults, uh, remember that fellowship meeting for young adults over in Newton Arts tonight, uh, an after church meeting over there. So do keep that in mind, young folks. Then our meetings during the week, uh, 8 p.m. on Tuesday evening, our prayer meeting. And as mentioned uh, before, uh, Janice and Malcolm uh, will be bringing a report uh, on uh, their trip out with all that uh, stuff that went uh, out to Poland uh, to go on then into Ukraine. So do keep that meeting in mind, please. Uh, Friday, 8 p.m., uh, that uh, Youth Fellowship will be on, even though it's uh, Good Friday. Uh, it will be the final night of the Youth Fellowship for this season, so do keep that in mind, young folks. Uh, 10 o'clock on Friday, the men's prayer meeting. Then, of course, uh, next weekend is the Easter weekend, uh, just to mention the Easter convention meetings. 8 p.m. Uh, on Friday evening uh, is the missionary and youth rally. Uh, there will be uh, youth council testimonies, missionary reports, uh, and uh, the soloist will be Miss uh, Charlotte Cahay. Uh, so do keep that meeting in mind. The speaker on Friday evening will be the Reverend Ian Harris, who's chairman uh, of the, our, our mission board. Uh, then the other meeting will be Monday, uh, Easter Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, testimonies from those involved in the mission board. Uh, there will be a report on 40 years of prison chaplaincy uh, and the singing will be by the Greer Brothers. And the speaker will be our moderator, uh, the Reverend John Armstrong. So remember uh, those Easter Convention meetings, please. Uh, next Lord's Day, our service is the usual time, so quarter past 10, Sunday school and Bible class, half past 11, 7 p.m. And God willing, uh, the Reverend Martin will be with us uh, for those services. Uh, can I mention again uh, that there will be a meeting for communicant members uh, after the prayer meeting on Tuesday the 3rd of May. Uh, we'll give you a wee bit more detail on that. It should be a relatively short meeting. Uh, it's to do with uh, our registration with the Charities Commission uh, for Northern Ireland. It just uh, requires a vote uh, of communicant members on that evening. Uh, can I mention as well that the next family night uh, will be uh, just two weeks away, I think it is. Uh, Sunday the 24th of April at our evening service uh, and there will be uh, a testimony by Mr Alfie Stewart uh, and the singer will be Mrs Ruth Carson so do keep that uh, meeting in mind just a couple of weeks away. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed Jackie for making those announcements. Uh, just to add to it as they're all subject to the divine will of God. Next Sunday night the mixed choir will be singing at our Easter Sunday service so no doubt there'll be a final practice tonight and maybe another one who knows uh, but they're, they're enjoying the fellowship and they're certainly enjoying the ministry and song. We trust the Lord will bless and encourage the mixed choir as they come next Sunday evening in the will of the Lord uh, to uh, minister in song to us. Could I say that uh, on the 24th we do have the family service service, Alfie Stewart, an ex Portadown footballer. He refused as a believer to receive the Guinness Player of the Year awards. He took a great stand and uh, he also uh, achieved much in life and as a believer he took a stand in sport and that certainly would interest our young people and he was player of the year on a number of occasions and he always refused to take the trophy because it was sponsored by Guinness and he took a stand. He wasn't popular for doing it uh, but uh, he certainly had the testimony of the Lord among uh, Irish League and international footballers and he belonged to share his testimony. Our sister Ruth Carson uh, will be along to minister in song. Keep that in mind. We will update our Facebook Facebook page with a little snippet of his testimony and uh, we want you to invite your friends and family to that service. Could we also say that that Sunday morning we'll be bringing in some new members on the 24th of April at our 
uh, communion table and uh, service. And if anyone has been exercised about membership and you've been praying about it and you haven't got round to it yet, well, here's an opportunity. There will be at least four new members being brought in uh, on the 24th in the morning time at the communion t uh, service. So if you could keep that in mind and you've been praying about it, if the Lord has exercised your heart at all, then please keep that in mind. Uh, this incoming week, uh, I do have uh, a wedding and a rehearsal tomorrow night and the wedding on Thursday, and I would appreciate your prayers uh, for that wedding. Quite a number of unsaved coming. Uh, maybe 80% would be unsaved, and I want to share the gospel at that joyous occasion as well, and we trust the Lord will be with us. And then this incoming week is also the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. And you say, well, what has that got to do with me or us? Well, I'm going to preach on it tonight. I'm going to preach on that anniversary, and I want to entitle the message, God's, or the Titanic, God's Object Lesson to the World. The Titanic, God's Object Lesson to the World. So please pray over these meetings. 260 is our next hymn, O soul, O ye weary and troubled, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I didn't know that card was available today, and it does tie in here with the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. really good singing, I have to tell you that. Let's turn again in our Bibles to the 73rd Psalm. <clears throat> With the word of God open before us, again we'll seek the Lord's face for help in the hearing and in the preaching of the word. Our loving Father, we thank thee for thy word today. We thank thee, Lord, for the gift of our English Bible, the scriptures of truth in our mother tongue, the oracles of God, the inspired record the infallible word of the living God. And as we come to look at this 73rd Psalm, directed by thy spirit in the study, we pray, Lord, that which was given in the secret place now would be declared in the public place, in the hearing of thy people, that which is given in the solemnity of the heart, 
Uh, Lord, declare now in the hearing of those that are present and those that are listening. We ask for thy presence and blessing now. We ask for thy help in this service. Take away every distraction, every wandering thought. Bring our minds into captivity to the obedience of Christ and to the counsel of thy word. Like Mary, let us choose that good part today and sit at thy feet to hear the word. Lord, speak to every single soul, saved and unsaved alike. And Lord, draw our souls out after thee. Come and minister the word to our heart. Speak, Lord, with a voice that wakes the dead and be, uh, causes thy people to hear. And grant, O God, that hearer and preacher alike will be blessed through the ministry of thy spirit, through the word. Exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and keep our hearts in tune with him. To this end, Almighty God, I ask humbly for the infilling of the spirit of the living God with wisdom and power. Leave me not, O God, to a human agency. Leave me not, O God, to human weakness and insufficiency and inability. Lord, in my weakness, I'm cast upon thee and divine, Lord, uh, power. I look to thee for help. I ask for grace. I pray, Lord, you will carry words to these lips of clay and grant to me the anointing of the Spirit. And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to bless thy word. Glorify thy Son, for we ask it with thanksgiving in his precious and worthy name. Amen. You know, the 73rd Psalm is what is known as the first of 11 consecutive psalms written by uh, the chief singer Asaph, or Asaph, whatever you want to call him. Uh, they bear his name. So Psalm 73, right to Psalm 83, they all bear the name in a consecutive pattern. All 11 psalms written by the same man. I know some commentators might argue that David wrote the psalm and then he dedicated it to Asaph, the chief singer. I don't accept that personally. I believe the title is inspired as much as the written word. And you can't uh, take away from God's word. That's why you cannot neither adjust the title to put David's name in it. If it was a psalm of David, the Holy Ghost would have told us that. And if he didn't want us to know who was the author, he wouldn't have put the name Asaph to it. And he certainly would have then taken the name away if he didn't want us even to know who the psalm was written by. But the author of these 11 psalms, all written consecutively, you'll find them from Psalm 73 right to 83, were written by Asaph. And he is a psalm or a song of Asaph. He actually has written 12 psalms. The other psalm, I was going to say you can have a look at home and go through all the 176 or so psalms that are found in your uh, Bible, uh, but I'll give it to you. It's a psalm number 50. We preached on it not so long ago. Uh, it's divorced from these other 11. We don't know why that was the occasion, but maybe he has written that just out of a burdened heart, but he wrote these psalms and they were put by inspiration consecutively in our Bible so we could literally read them as a single book, all 11 psalms, and I challenge you to do that. Have a study of Psalm 73 right to 83 because they're all written consecutively. And then for some reason, isolated from those 11 Psalms, Asaph's singular Psalm, Psalm number 50, making up a total of 12 Psalms written by the chief singer, this man, Asaph. It's remarkable because uh, we consider, as we look at this Psalm, uh, that it has a, a, a tremendous theme, as do a few other Psalms. The theme of Psalm 73, you could write this over your Bible, is the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. That was the problem that he had when he wrote this psalm. That was the problem when he gave these words to be sung in the temple or in the tabernacle. He had a perplexity. He saw the wicked and he saw them prospering in this world. And he looked at the godly, those that were faithful to Jehovah, and they suffered and they were in poverty, and they were persecuted, and they were oppressed, and they were not recognized in the world. But the ungodly and the wicked, who deserve the judgment of God, they don't seem to suffer. In fact, they increase. The Bible says they waxed fat, and they have all that they could wish and heart desire. It's everything on their plate, and the wicked prosper, and the godly suffer. And that was something that was a problem to many of God's people in the Old Testament and is still a problem for God's people today. Why is it that men like Putin and individuals in this world who are wicked, 
Why is it that the LGTBQ+, whatever it is, transgender nonsense, gets all the recognition in government? Why is it that the church's voice is never heard when it comes to, and especially in the last sitting of Stormont, in the passing of legislation that now bans any protest at an abortion clinic, Soon it will be that you'll not be able to protest anything biblically within a three-mile radius, which would be futile, totally futile. They've literally banned the gospel and prayer and testimony and the right and the freedom to protest. It is an infringement on civil and religious liberty. It is a denial of the civil rights of believers. And where's Amnesty International now? Where are they to be found? Are they looking into it? No. I'm not sure if you saw the celebration video in Stormont by those supporters and MLAs rejoicing in the fact that people are now excluded from protesting abortion and abortion right up until birth. The murdering of the unborn, the killing of a child, a human being, a life in the womb. That's what it is. And there needs to be a cry against it and a stand against it. And I trust the Lord will give us help because we're living in wicked days when the wicked do prosper. Now, incidentally, for those who are students of the word, and I would say this as well to our young people, if you wanted a corresponding psalm, young people, to study, then here's what you need to do. Take the 73rd psalm and turn the numbers around and go to the 37th psalm. And if you're reading this 37th Psalm, turn the numbers around and go to the 73rd Psalm. And you will find that the subject matter of both those Psalms, a Psalm of Asaph and a Psalm of David, they have exactly the same subject matter. The wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. And for those who are keen for Bible study, and especially for the young, and it'll be easy for you to remember this. Just turn the numbers around. Whether you're in Psalm 73, it'll bring you to Psalm 37. Or Psalm 37, turn the numbers around and it'll bring you to Psalm 73. And that's how you'll know to link those two Psalms in your Bible. They have exactly the same subject matter. The same theme runs through both Psalms. David himself said, fret not thyself in Psalm 37 because of evildoers, because of the man, the evil man that prospereth in his sin and his way. And so you have a similar, similar theme running through both of those Psalms and you have a conclusion to both Psalms, exactly how the believer is to react to the prosperity of the wicked and the success of ungodly individuals. Now the apparent success of the wicked and the afflictions and sorrows of those who were truly born again and saved the godly has often been a temptation to many individuals. It has caused many to backslide, to stop going to the house of God. It has caused many to lose heart and they've stopped reading their Bible. They have stopped praying. They no longer see the value of evangelism. They no longer see the worth of taking a stand for the Lord. They've concluded foolishly, as did David, as did Asaph, in those psalms given over to this very theme. They literally have felt like Asaph. They've literally cleansed their heart in vain and they've washed their hands in innocency that it's a, a futile thing. It's unrewarding and there's no recompense. For those who live godly, there's no recognition. It seems that God doesn't even vindicate their stand, but God allows the wicked to prosper and the righteous to even suffer more. And the more I live for the Lord, the more I do for the Lord, it seems that I become a target for the devil and the oppression of the wicked, and therefore they've quit. And there are many today, I want to tell you, you could go around the homes in Cumber and North Down and elsewhere in this province and you will meet genuine believers. We're not talking about false professors. We're not talking about those who say they're saved and they're not. We're talking about those who are truly born again and they're saved and they're not in church today and they're not online ministry today. You might find them in some shopping mall today or some golf course or before a television or reading the Sunday papers and following the politics and the curse of loyalism so-called in this province and republicanism as well. 
and they're following all those things but the Lord. And when you meet with them, they just say, well, as far as I'm concerned is, God treated me unfairly. A lot of things happened in my life, and the wicked, look at them, and they mention the names of them. Look at how they're prospering. Look how well they're doing. And I'm struggling all my life. And God has never blessed me. How wrong they are. And Asaph, he had to deal with the same problem. He had to deal with the same subject matter. And the same issue met him. And the same temptation. And he very nearly slipped. In fact, he tells us that in the psalm. My feet had almost gone. I nearly slipped away from the Lord. I nearly stopped following the Lord. I nearly quit on God. I nearly threw the towel in and said, that's enough. I can cope no more. The psalmist Asaph here in the 73rd Psalm, he fought this battle in his heart and in his mind and he resisted. He resisted the temptation to quit. Every way the psalm opens with a godly man's trial and it does. It concludes with a godly man's triumph. While it commences, I know, uh, thankfully, about how the godly get into temptation. It concludes with how the godly, the saved, get out of temptation and still are able to go on with the Lord. The psalm can be easily divided into four parts, very easily. And the key to dividing this psalm is not just the subject matter, but it has to do with the eyes. You could write over this Psalm 73, the eyes of Asaph, the eye of the believer. This psalm will naturally, and it will theologically, and it will scripturally and spiritually divide equally into four parts. And you could summarize it with this title which you have given the psalm. The four looks of the psalmist, or the four looks of Asaph. The first look is in verses 2 to 12. And here he looked around and became discouraged. He looked around. He got his eyes off the Lord. And he started to look at the world around him. And he started to focus on things that were going on in this earth and things that were going on in this world and the injustice and the sorrow and suffering and the misery and the pain and the heartache that this world has brought upon mankind since the fall in Adam. And he began to look around him. And when he did so, he became extremely despondent and discouraged and what a lesson there is there for us Ahaz or Asaph took his eyes off the Lord and he fixed his gaze upon the activity of the ungodly around him and he saw in this psalm some things that discouraged his heart and nearly caused him to lose out with God if you notice with me he saw that they were careless the ungodly were even in the face of death and judgment. If you look at Psalm 73 and the verse 4, he goes on to describe what he saw. He says, this is what I saw. This is why I became despondent. This is why, as verse 2, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Look at verse 4. There are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. That is, they're cold, they're callous. Speak to them about hell, and they laugh. In the face of hell. Speak to them about God and his holiness and his righteousness. And they're callous in their attitude to judgment. They don't care. And even when they come to die. You would imagine that an ungodly man living his life. In sin and rebellion against almighty God. That when he comes to die. He would have some thought that he might be wrong. He had some conscience. Some sense of guilt. That his death would be agonizingly painful. But it wasn't. At the last he celebrated. A life given over to debauchery. And went out into eternity. With no regrets. That's what the psalmist saw. And he saw the righteous suffering even in death, sensitive to their sin and to their failures before an almighty God, knowing they're going out to meet the Lord now. He saw it and it discouraged his heart for he looked around and he became discouraged. You notice in verse 5 of the psalm, 
It says there they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. When he saw the ungodly, you would imagine that God somehow would chasten them. God somehow would discipline them. That he would put a restraint upon their lives. He would stop them in their sin and they would go no further. But when he looked at that, that's not what he saw. And when we look at it today, that's not what we see. We have the same problem. They are not in trouble as other men. It seems they escape in this world at least. We know that not in the next. They escape the pains and the trials which the godly are called upon to endure in verse 5. They're not plagued like other men, like believers, like Christians, like the saved and the redeemed. It seems that they're not experiencing what the righteous go through. It seems the ungodly have the best of this world and the righteous have nothing or very little at most. And you notice in verse 6, they're full of pride and boasting. They fear not to attack any who stand in their way. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence cover them as a garment. They're not afraid to lash out. They're not afraid to break the law. They're not afraid to be above the law. And how dare anyone censor their lives? Now, where have you heard that? We're living in it today. Don't you deny a woman the right to kill her child. That's what abortion is. How dare you censor her? How dare you tell her what to do with her body? How dare you? Who do you think you are? That's what they tell us. That's what they tell us. To tell a woman what she can do with her child. By the way, there's no mention of the man and his child. Where's the men when it comes to abortion? Where's their cry? Where's their right? If it's their child. Doesn't seem to be given to them. Or else they don't really care. Or else maybe they're not about. We don't know. But all we know is this. That anybody who censures them. And don't you tell me. That I cannot be transgender. That I cannot be homosexual or lesbian. Who do you think you are? How dare you quote the Bible to me? How dare you judge me? And they put a tattoo on their arm. Only God can judge me. And that's true and he will. But we have the right to be mouthpieces for the Lord. And to speak out against social and moral evils in society. And we have the duty to do that or we fail the Lord. Because we will stand before God. But we will not be popular. The wicked will prosper. They get their way. Legislation will protect them. And it will force us to keep quiet. If they don't kill us they'll silence us. Which is nearly the same thing. The same thing. May come a day when they will feel it be better to put a Christian to death. Maybe they will bring the death penalty back, not for murder, but for a Christian who speaks with hate, as they call it, just because you disagree and you stand up for the morals and the law of God in the Bible. Notice in verse 7, they're full of this world's goods and they seem to want for nothing. You've seen the wicked. You've seen, I don't know, if you looked at Putin's life, which I did, and the wealth that that man has. And to think of what they have taken from him and what he has left, it's pittance. What Britain and America has done, it's laughable when they put it into the social media and the papers. It's totally laughable. It's like taking off a millionaire ten p. They've taken his big massive boat, a luxury cruise liner. They've taken all his properties and houses. That's nothing to what that man actually is worth, to what his wife has and what his children have. They try to censor his children now. It's nothing. And if you think of some individuals in this world, in Saudi Arabia and many other places, oil-rich countries, filthy rich billionaires, trillionaires, you name it, that more than anything, and yet they're godless, and they persecute, and they put to death believers in their own country, they behead them for reading the Bible, for mentioning the name of Jesus Christ. And you think of what the psalmist saw. It's right up to date. He tells us, verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. And it goes on to say they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. That is, they neither fear God, nor do they fear man. They'll speak what they think they need to say. Notice they cause the people of God anxiety. Notice what it says in verse 10. 
You've got to see the change here, the emphasis of Asaph. Verse 10 is not the ungodly. Therefore his people, that's the Lord's people, return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. In other words, uh, he's drawn a comparison here. God's people run to the Lord. They return to him again. And they bring the matter to him, Lord, why is it so? The wicked prospering and the righteous suffering, why are these ungodly men, these wicked individuals, why are they getting the best of this world? Why is it that the ungodly politician gets more votes than the Christian one? Why is it that the ungodly, the wicked, the pro-abortion, the the, the lobbyists that are pro-sodomy, why is it they're elected And the believer, the Christian, the child of God who takes a stand, the heart of the people is not with them. And yet the heart of the people, is it not in your hand, O God? Could you not turn it toward them? No, it doesn't happen. Occasions it does, yes. Very rarely in our nation. Maybe just exclusively now and again in our province. But we can see that the people of God are anxious, they're confused, they're forced to flee to God in the midst of it all, and ask the Lord like Asaph, why? And like David, why? They dismiss the righteous judgment of the Lord and they cry, and he doesn't see, hear, or care. Notice what it says in verse 11, and they say, how doth God know? Is there any knowledge in the Most High? They more or less say, God doesn't care. If there's a God in heaven, why doesn't he strike me down? If I'm so wrong as you say and so bad and so evil and I'm heading for hell and judgment, if you say in your Bible says, where's your God? Come on, where is he? He's not there, that's why. I defy him. I call upon him now to judge me. Send lightning from heaven if you exist. They've done it. They have done it. I want to give you an illustration. It's not in my notes, but there was a gentleman and he was heading, I think, to church and he took a shortcut from a very bad area in in America and there was wee boys playing around and it was their territory and the little fella came out, only a little boy, and the man was, was overpowering him and he put his fists up and he says, this is my area. You're not getting through. You're not getting through. And the man stood and he looked at him and he could have just pushed him out of his way with his hand and the little boy with his fists he says you're not getting through this is my area I'm defending this area you're not getting through and and if I remember the illustration right the man did a turn and he went the other way and you say why did he do that well there's a verse came to his mind from scripture and as that little boy was waving the puny fist in his face as far as he could reach a little verse came I think it's from the book of Isaiah. I'm going from memory here. Where the Lord says, fury is not in me. The Lord says, fury is not in me. And he turned as an example of his Lord. And he walked away. He went to church. He's used the illustration, no doubt, in ministry and preaching, I'm sure. A picture of the Lord. And the ungodly waving a puny fist. Where is God? There's no knowledge in the Most High. He can't see here. You know, he's blind. He's deaf. He's dumb. He's inactive. He's paralyzed if he's even there. Where is he? And yet the Lord says, fury is not in me. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and faith in Christ. He's long-suffering to usward. He does not deal with us or, or, or even work with us after our sins. And he is kind and benevolent. And fury is not in God until, until his patience were thin at the coming of the Lord and the terrible judgment of Almighty God. So you can see the psalmist not only looked around But moving on very quickly, you'll notice the psalmist looked within. In verses 13 through 16, he all of a sudden decided that he would have a look within his own heart. And he would look at the state of his own soul as he was looking around him. And look what happened to his own heart. Verse 13, verily, I have cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long, I have been plagued, but they haven't. And chastened every morning, but they haven't. And if I say, I will speak thus, I'll offend against the generation of thy children. I can never do right. And when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. 
So he looked around and he was discouraged and he looked within and he was disappointed. He was so disappointed and when he got his eyes off Christ and of the Lord, his outward focus produced foolish reasoning in his heart and mind and he says it's a vain thing to walk with God. <coughs> there is no reward for living for Christ. Now that's what he said. That's the conclusion he reached here. And he's being open and honest before us. We would never have known that he suffered this. We would have held him up as the chief singer. A godly man. who never suffered any problems. And went on with the Lord. And never backslid. He did. He backslid in heart here. And he even reasoned in his own soul. When he saw what was going on around him. He says what's the value in religion? What's the value in going on with God and obeying the commandments of God when the wicked are better off by disobeying? That's how he foolishly reasoned. He wrongly concluded that there was no real lasting benefit in honoring the Lord and standing for Christ and living a life of holiness and righteousness and being morally upright and walking the path of the just and the righteous and continuing on that path for a very long time without Deviation to the right or left hand. You know, brethren and sisters, beloved, this is the conclusion we will all reach if we take our eyes off the Lord today. Where's your focus? What do you place your eyes upon? What are you looking at today? What is your gaze? What's your mind fixed on? What do you talk about the most? What occupies your thought life, your conversation with your family, your friends and your work college and others? And then when you look within, when you've taken your eyes off the Lord, you begin to wonder, is it worth it all? I pray for my unsaved loved ones and they're getting worse, getting further from God and they won't even come to a gospel meeting. Easy to give up, isn't it? Easy to say it's a waste of time. It just doesn't seem any profit in prayer. Seems that we'll have no merit in holy living because the wicked, they get everything. And the more morally upright and more scriptural and biblical I live, then I become opposition to the entire world and I will eventually break the law. The law of men, that is, not God. There's no value, therefore, in keeping his commandments because you're just going to be punished and suffer here. It seems there's no worth in reading the word and standing up for the truth of God because everyone else doesn't read it and don't stand and they're blessed. And I am in difficulties every way. No need, therefore, to go to the house of God for fellowship. No need to meet with believers on a regular basis. I can just drift in and out of church or watch it on the internet or even not bother at all. There's no reward for service. Well, in many ways, that's what Asaph said. I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. I've washed them without thinking. There was no need to do it. That's what he concluded. Yet he's a saved man. And he's speaking under inspiration. And he's a lesson. You know, such a look around us and then a look within us will result in many a child of God quitting too soon, throwing the towel in, or literally uh, being sidetracked into what John Bunyan called bypass meadow. It'll cause discouragement. It'll cause disappointment. And the devil will use it to his advantage. He will convince you that it's useless working, working with and working for the Lord Jesus Christ. You suffer. Uh, and you are sad, and the right, or the godly prosper, and they're happy. You're miserable, and you're suffering, and the wicked, look at them. They're laughing, they're joking, they're running to their pleasure houses, and they're enjoying themselves, and I'm enduring things, and passing through what you feel is a terrible, terrible time. Now tell me, child of God, what is your focus today? Where are your eyes spiritually? Are they on Ukraine? Are they? On Putin, what's going to happen? Are they on a third world war? Are they? Are they on a nuclear threat and the earth being destroyed by man? It's not going to happen. Where's your focus today? On the price increase, the energy, the fuel bills? I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned about these things, but where's your focus? 
on the elections coming up, whether Sinn Féin will be the largest party or not, or who I should vote for. What is it that has commanded your attention? The success of the sodomite pro-abortion lobbyists, the state of our nation and our province. What is it that you've focused on? And you've taken your eyes off the Lord and you're now getting discouraged and you're becoming disappointed even in your own life. Well, we're going to move through this quickly. Here's your third look. Here's where your eyes should be. Notice what the psalmist, the psalmist Asaph did here. His gaze was in the wrong place and the Lord had to take his hand gently and just lift his chin and his eyes up to heaven. And that's exactly what happened in this psalm. And you notice there in verse 17, he says all what he said and I've tried to expound some of it. That's all, just some of it. But he says now in verse 17, uh, verse 16, if you think of it, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until... Verse 17, I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. His focus now is on Christ. His eyes are heavenward, upward, and he looked up and he was delighted. Surely thou hast set them, verse 18, in slippery places. Why am I envious? David says, fret not yourself because of evil doers or because of the man, the evil man, the wicked man that prospereth in his way. The Lord has set them in slippery places. They're on a slippery slope to judgment. You should pity them, not envy them. You shouldn't covet what they have, but you should have compassion and try to reach them and turn them away from their wicked ways. And you should keep doing that because God has set them in slippery places. And you know what it's like if there were no steps out there and it's the dead of winter, although we could still get it, snow, the dead of winter, there's no steps out the front. It's the only exit from the church today. And the snow's lying thick on it. And underneath is at least an inch of ice. And there you are. And there are no steps. It's, just, it's no steps. It's just a slide. That's all it is, a ramp. And there's no grip. The moment you put your foot on that, you will go. And when your feet go, your body goes with you. Your body goes with you. And there's no handrail, let's say that. We don't want you to fall going out now. I'll definitely get the blame for it. You can imagine you're on a slippery slope. And you'll understand. And I want to say to you, spiritually, that is the case with the psalmist here. He was about to go, my feet had now slipped until. And I realized the Lord had set the ungodly in slippery places. They're sliding into hell. And they're going there quicker than they think. And they only have a little moment of pleasure. A little spark as Elihu, the friend of Job, although he applied the word to Job, the wrong person, said, a little spark. The candle of the wicked, that's all it is. How long does a candle burn? Depending on its thickness, depending on its height, it only burns for a little season. It never gives off eternal light. One single candle. Should you make the candle the size of this earth and put a little wick in the center of this earth and make it a candle that would never burn for all eternity and in the light of eternity it's only a millisecond and so the candle of the wicked will be put out. They are to be pitied. They are not to be envied. You're not to say, look at them. Look at them. They're happy. They're running to pleasure. Look at me. And maybe a young person feels like this. I have to go to church and I have to go to Sunday school Bible class and I can't run with them to the snooker club. I can't go out to the, the formal. I can't go out to the nightclub. I'm stuck in here. I'm a Christian. My life's miserable. I would put a question mark, by the way, over someone who would say all that, by the way. But maybe they felt something of that as a true Christian. And they say, why? Well, I want to tell you something. It's short-lived, young person. And you're not missing anything. You are not. You'll only bring pain and misery and woe to you and to your family and your friends and the testimony of the Lord. Better to suffer as a young believer. Walk the path of the righteous. Keep on a straight course with Christ. Hold fast to his word. Love him with all your heart. Give him the best years of your life just as young Josiah did when he was saved at 16. And when he started to purge Jerusalem at the age of 20, and then when he was 26 years of age, he reformed the land and took all the idols away. And he died in a very young age, but he commenced with God early. 
I want to tell you, youth is the impressionable age. Now, I know salvation is of the Lord. I know God is completely sovereign when it comes to who's saved and when they're saved. I believe that with all my heart. But I'll tell you this, youth is the impressionable age. It's the impressionable age. And therefore, you can be impressed. And truth can be impressed on your heart and mind when you get alone with God and into the sanctuary. And that's what had happened. The psalmist now was looking around. The psalmist then looked within and the Lord took his chin and lifted it up and he started to look up and he was delighted and he saw that the best for him was yet to be and there was terrible judgment for the ungodly. They were to be pitied, they were to be prayed for, they were to be witnessed, they were to be evangelized, they were to be taught the things of God. I need to be up and doing, I need to reach these people. I don't care what way they're living or what things they're enjoying, I need to go. I don't care if they tell me I'm a killjoy. I don't tell me if I'm a, I'm a Bible thumper. I don't care if they tell me I'm a holy Joe. I don't care even if they say to me, I don't care about these things. Well, I care about you. And I care about your spiritual well-being. I have an interest in the value of your soul. And I'd like to see you saved. And come to know Christ as your Savior. And you'll thank me in eternity. If you're with me in heaven, for the day I approached you, and persevered with you, and brought you to no, understand you're a sinner I have a need of a saviour you know one day the ungodly will bow the knee to Christ they will bow the knee to Christ they will acknowledge that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father they will be forced the wicked that prosper they will be forced and the righteous that suffer they will be vindicated and they will enter into the joy of their Lord in front of the wicked that prospered in their day and generation. So how foolish was the psalmist whenever he got his eyes off the Lord and then he looked within and the Lord had to lift his eyes. And I want to say to you, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim. They'll not have the same conclusion and result and they'll go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we conclude, he looked around, he was discouraged. He looked within and was disappointed. But then he looked up and he was delighted. And he looked ahead and he was determined. In verses 23 to 28, we haven't time to read them, but I read verse 25, for that is the central verse of this look ahead Look at it says there in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. The Lord is everything. He's everything on earth. And he's everything in eternity. He's everything now. And he's everything hereafter. Whom have I in heaven? The Lord. He's there for me. He's coming back for me. He loves me. He cares for me. He's watching over me. He's providing for me. And whom on earth do I desire? Who do I need? More than the Lord. And if I have Christ, I have everything for time and for eternity. And so the psalmist pleads and pledges rather allegiance to the Lord as we do to Christ. We will put nothing before him. We will work and we will serve. We will honor and we will glorify the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Remember, an upward look will always result in the onward look. And we need to press on. We need to go on serving the Lord. We need to go on living for Christ, loving Christ, and walking with Christ, and sharing Christ, and being like Christ. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and you will be delighted and determined. It's all to do with the eyes. Keep your eyes upon the Lord. And don't be like Peter. And look around you. And then look within you and the fear comes. But look to the Lord and you'll walk upon the troubled waters. Father in heaven. Do bless now the ministry of the word of God. Take that which only has been of thyself. And back at home and burn it into every heart. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon the Israel of God, both now and forevermore. Amen.